Okay, good. Thank you very much uh, to the organizers for being here. In particular, I guess Andre and I met last millennium in Trieste many years ago when we were both just coming out of, well, we're still students, but we're just students. And I'm, of course, very happy to continue the many discussions we've had in such nice places. Uh, and it's wonderful to see so many other old friends and to make some new ones here in with such a beautiful backdrop. So thank you very much. All right. So today I'd like to tell you about another superconducting system, uh, a one that's fascinated us for many years. And I'd like to, and when I say us, I believe in the collective nature of science. So I mean the scientific community. And so today I'd like to tell you about some adventures that Pavel, oh, it's working, good. I think I have to stand here. Uh, Pavel Volkov, Piers Coleman, Pavel Volkov, who's crossed the Atlantic, Piers Coleman, who's upstairs, and I uh, have had thinking about superconductivity in dilute quantum critical metals. Now you'll have to excuse me because uh, there's something that doesn't quite work with this Mac. And so, oh, here we go. Okay, so I have to be coordinated, which is not my strong point. Okay, so I'll try. So what's the big question? The big question is in these systems, how do we get isotropic superconducting pairing without retardation to overcome Coulomb repulsion? Okay, and what we will argue is that we have interactions between the electrons that are mediated by energy fluctuations of the polar medium. So we're going to argue that the electrons don't interact with the zero point fluctuations directly, but like variants and dark matter, they interact via the energy tensor. And I'd like to tell you why we've come up with these ideas. So let's begin at the beginning. The details of what I'll tell you about can be found there. So let me start at the beginning. What is a polar metal? Okay, well, you might say they're sort of contradictions in terms. In a metal, we have screening. In a system with polarization, we have a microscopic dipole moment. So what does it mean to have a polar metal? Well, yes, we have screening of dipole moments, but many years ago at Bell Labs, Anderson and Blount realized that you could have the inversion symmetry breaking transition into a phase with a polar space group, even if you don't have to have a macroscopic polarization, okay? So the point is you basically have everything to do with a ferroelectric transition except the polarization. And that's what we have in a polar metal. Now, this idea sort of lay dormant for many, many years but now more recently, we've found, and again, when I say we, I mean the greater community, we found that there are many intrinsic and engineered polar metals that exist. And in particular, in recent years, in the search for vile semi-metals, as we've heard this conference, uh, particularly, for example, tungsten ditelluride, ditelluride bilayer and bulk, we find that there are a lot of polar semi-metals. And in particular, we can tune the polar transition with chemical substitution or strain as we've seen in many talks. And the question that we can ask is, do we have exotic phases? Marco, it's working great, thank you. Okay, can we get exotic phases, right? We know that close to a quantum critical point, we've heard, in many talks here that we have the possibility of exotic phases. What about close to a quantum, uh, a polar quantum critical point? So the question is, can metals near polar quantum critical points host strongly correlated phases? And we know from looking from, again, work, many of you here, that for example, the nature of those strongly correlated phases depends a lot on the nature of the quantum critical point, whether it's pneumatic, whether it's anti-ferromagnetic, ferromagnetic, whatever. 
Now, what is the challenge near a polar quantum critical point? Challenge is how do we get strong electronic coupling to a critical Q equals zero polar mode? I remind you that the standard way of getting strong coupling and getting strong correlations near a quantum critical point is Yukawa coupling. You couple the critical mode to the electron density. Okay, but here the critical mode breaks inversion symmetry. So you can't do that unless you have something like spin orbit coupling. Okay, so how do you couple it? And uh, this was a question that Pavel and I asked recently. And what we realized was that without spin orbit coupling, the only way to get a Yukawa type approach was to actually have multi bands. That's how you get around inversion symmetry breaking. You have two bands with different uh, parities and you can do that. But then what we were after was, could we get a non-Fermi liquid? Well, of course you have the strongest coupling when you have, when you have uh, interaction of the critical mode with gapless particle hole excitations. So we looked at a number of different band crossings. We looked at 3D, uh, then we looked at 2D, and we looked also at 3D vial points. What we did find was we could get non-Fermi liquid behavior in 2D systems with vial, with vial nodes. Okay, so it is possible to get strongly correlated uh, Phases, of course, it requires fine tuning. There are some experimental systems where this might be appropriate. Okay, but that's not the story I want to tell you about today. That's just the backdrop. So now the natural question is, can polar quantum criticality drive superconductivity? And we have a poster child for this. In fact, we only have really one, namely superconductivity in dilute quantum critical polar metals, there has been for a very long time the mystery of doped strontium titanate. Now, strontium titanate is a perovskite. It's a close cousin of barium titanate, which was the darling perovskite in the 60s, partly because it's a ferroelectric, and at that time, particularly at places like Bell Labs, people were very interested in making memory. Okay, and at Bell Labs, there was a, and at, uh, as a, I was lucky enough to be a summer student at Bell Labs, and that's when I first learned about strontium titanate. Um, barium titanate was studied quite a bit. Actually, the best samples were by Joe, John Ramika, Joe Ramika, and I heard about Ramika crystals actually the other day from Malta. He was an incredible guy. So Joe Ramika made these wonderful barium titanate crystals. And they were working really hard to make ferroelectric memory. Okay, it lost out to magnetic bubble memory, but they had wonderful, wonderful samples. Now, strontium titanate was the black sheep in the family. Strontium titanate is uh, isostructural to barium titanate. It's very similar in many ways, but it doesn't go ferroelectric. Okay. So from the point of view of memory, it was completely useless. It was just there. People studied it, but whatever. But recently it's come into its own, okay? And of course, I like the rebellious one in the family. So I like strontium titanate. So in any case, but let me tell you a little bit of the story here because we're on the last day. And as Andre said, we need philosophy, we need stories. I need to keep you uh, engaged. Okay, so. Let's talk about strontium tightening. This is a review recently by uh, Cameron Benia and friends. I certainly couldn't uh, put all the references to the papers, but let me just show you what the story is. We have a TC and we have as a function of density uh, for strontium titanate that's doped with oxygen vacancies. We have this lower uh, bump. And here we have a dome. Look familiar? This is the first perovskite superconductor. Okay, so what's the big issue? Very nice. Well, this is an incredibly dilute superconductor. Okay. TF, for example, for these densities is about 13. TD is the Debye temperature is 400. That means that TF is much, much less 
than TD, and we have slow electrons and fast phonons. Now remember that for BCS, we need slow, but we want fast electrons and slow phonons. Remember, normally we have T to by is less than TF, but here we have the opposite way around. Okay, so we cannot use the conventional BCS theory in this. However, we have two gap over TC, which is very close to the BCS value. And we can't use our LO phonon. And the point is we seem to have a good Fermi liquid in the system in the normal state. So what is going on? Okay. So let's talk about the challenges in this system. How do we overcome Coulomb repulsion? We have no retardation and we have a good old fashioned S wave superconductor. We can't play the angular momentum game, okay? Like in helium. The other thing is that even though the optical phonon doesn't couple to the electron density, and here I'm going to assume no spin orbit coupling, we'll get back to that shortly. In the experiments of the Cambridge group, Gil Lonswich and colleagues, they find that there is a very, very, there is an enhancement of TC as you approach the quantum critical point. So even though the electrons cannot couple directly to the critical boson, they definitely know about it and you can enhance TC with that. So how does this work? Because remember the critical mode is a transverse optical phonon. It doesn't couple to the electron density. Another way of saying it is it breaks inversion symmetry. You can't couple to the electron density. So what's going on? So we have negligible direct coupling between the electron and the soft mode, unless there's spin orbit coupling. And this is titanium, okay? It's not high Z. So let me try and put some context to all of this. And I'm thankful to the review that our colleagues, Maria, Jonathan, and Raphael have made on this, because of course I couldn't put all the references since 1967. Now, particularly for those of you who are students in the audience, I want to tell you a very interesting tale. And perhaps the take home message here is to beware of theorists. And I am a theorist, but I worked in a lab and I have a huge respect for experimentalists because I do not have magic fingers. So superconductivity in, in strontium titanate, how did it happen? So the story was that Marvin Cohen, who's still at Berkeley, was still at Berkeley then, he was an expert in semiconductors. And in the early 60s, you know, there was a huge excitement about superconductivity. And people were really interested in applying BCS and all of this. Well, Marvin's approach was, look, semiconductors have been really well studied because, of course, for, for, uh, application, for, for applications. Would it be possible to study superconductivity in semiconductors? So he had a lot of, so of course, one of the problems in semiconductor, in a semiconductor, the idea was you would dope it and see if it could go superconducting. Well, one of the problems with doping, dilute, is the fact that the Coulomb repulsion will be very strong, okay? The Coulomb repulsion will be long range, which is a Q equals zero instability. So what uh, Marvin thought about was he said, wait a minute, I know a lot about semiconductors. And in particular, he had done quite a bit of work on gallium arsenide. Gallium arsenide is a multi-valley superconductor. It's a multi-valley semiconductor. Okay. So what uh, Marvin suggested was he said, let's consider superconductivity, but not in the usual case, but by invoking large wave vectors from valley to valley. And if you do that, then you can somehow get around the Coulomb interaction. So he wrote down a theory and then, and this is one of the few cases where it was predicted. Then he went downstairs to the experimental lab of Kunzi and Al, <coughs> and he calculated a TC as a function of density. He got a nice dome. And then he predicted it 
and they did the measurement. And this is what they got. You see TC as a function of density. This is niobium doped. And with all due respect, Andy, you said, if theory and experiment match beautifully, then it must be right. Beware of theorists, and this will include me, showing you fits to domes. Because this fit beautifully, uh, but what happened? Well, Len Mattis at Bell Labs did the band structure calculation for strontium titan. There's only one valley. So this is like the Cheshire cat with the smile. It was a, one of the few superconductors that was actually predicted, beautiful analytic work, predicted, very good fit with experiment, but unfortunately the main assumption is not correct. So we still have this. I don't work with theorists like that. <laughs> Marvin Cohen's a pretty good theorist. <laughs> And in fact, I should tell you that Marvin Cohen, as Sebastian, who uh, we know from Rutgers and works in density functional theory, can attest, some of the best pseudo potentials for density functional theory were developed by Marvin Cohen. And when I tell my density functional theory friends, oh, I'm working on strontium titanate superconductivity, they say, wait, Marvin solved it. What's the problem? Okay, so let's continue. So there are many possibilities. Uh, to extend conventional BCS. And the flavor that I'm going to talk about and Dimitri will talk about also later is a two phonon process. The notion is you can't couple to one polar phonon because of inversion symmetry breaking, but you can couple to two. Okay, we're gonna talk about that in a minute. Uh, quantum criticality is important. Strontium titanate is very close to its quantum critical point. The good news about that for us is that the, uh, the uh, dielectric constant diverges that means Coulomb interaction is weak. We like that. Yes? Can I just ask you two questions? Sure. So uh, you made two comments. First, you say the phonons are fast compared to the electrons. And then the second thing is you're talking about critical phonons. Those on the surface sound contradictory. Could you just clarify? Oh, sorry. So the point is the Debye frequency is small compared. The Debye frequency is large compared to the uh, the Debye frequency, which usually refers to the acoustic phonons, is very large compared to the Fermi energy. But it involves all the phonons. Yes. And now what I'm going to talk about with the critical phonons is the transverse optical mode. Okay, sorry for the confusion. Thank you. Yes. The same, the same issue with the more conventional electric phonon effect. If you start with the model of interacting electrons, yes. and you use electric phonon interaction as a way to normalize the electric current. Yes. Is total interaction still responsive or not? Okay, so Andre's asking me a hard question, so I have to repeat it slowly. Uh, what Andre is asking me is if I consider, and I think Nikolai is going to ask something similar, if I consider a problem with just electrons where I uh, include the phonons only in the dielectric constant. No, I include the electron phonon interaction. Okay, maybe. Yeah, ma the representation of I know, Coulomb interaction. Oh, like, Coulomb interaction. Is it. Coulomb interaction on screening. Then in the conventional case, it's totally as you know very well. Yes. The total interaction remains without you, but we use the flow frequency. Yes. Which in some particular, if you integrate our high energy theories, so McMillan's story of yes. action attraction. Yes. So when you talk about solution, here you said the word that electron component, electron electron interaction is irrelevant because that is a constant. Uh, but uh, is it already the story that you assume that you integrate with high energy? Yes. And you're only focusing on low energy. I'm only focusing on low energies. Yes, and I know you're going to make it. Oh, and I thought you were going to ask me about Coulomb repulsion. Okay, yes, go ahead. What is the rate of RS? Oh, we're going to talk about that. It's much less than one. And the reason it's much less than one is because in the, in the because of the dielectric constant. Okay. Yeah, okay. So, yes, I will get there. Okay, so quantum criticality is important, okay? You can have multi-band effects, you can have spin-orbit coupling, and a popular approach to this problem is to involve some sort of Rashba coupling. And then you can have a direct coupling between the polar mode 
and the electron density. Okay, now I have more to say about that. Okay. Uh, and again, this is a wonderful review, which I recommend. Okay, so let's talk about spin orbit coupling. I myself have trouble understanding why spin orbit coupling should be so important in a system with titanium. There's a large spin orbit gap, but the point is that what we're interested in is how that gap changes as we distort the crystal, okay? And this is a question that with our density functional colleagues we've been looking at, okay? But the, another point is, can we determine this experimentally? Okay, and with Abhishek and Pavel, both wonderful postdocs at Rutgers, we've looked into this. Suppose you did just very briefly, suppose you did have a Rashba interaction, okay? And let's look in the nearly polar phase. Well, in that case, oh, I have to use this. In that case, we would have dynamical spin splitting of the bands. And if we turned on a magnetic field, then we would have collective modes associated with the development of spin currents in the polar metal. So just to make a long story short, we would have collective modes as a function of field, but we would also have our soft mode. And those two would hybridize, okay? And the gap will be a function of that spin orbit coupling. And we worked out the, uh, the uh, exper experimental numbers in terms of fields and all of that, and that can actually be measured, okay? And I should also say that we're doing DFT studies uh, with our Rutgers colleagues, both to get the strength of the spin orbit coupling and also to get the strength of the uh, two phonon coupling that I'll be talking about. So what are the guiding observations that Piers, Pavel and I have, have, have played into ours, okay? The first thing is that we have very strong ionic screening. So we have very weak Coulomb interactions between the electrons. Okay, so the dielectric constant is very large near the polar quantum critical point, and we'll see that that means that RS is very small, even though it's dilute. Then the other point is that we have a critical mode that is inversion symmetry breaking, so there's no linear coupling to the charge density. And here we're assuming, we're, I'm, everything I'm going to say, we're assuming negligible spin orbit coupling. So the electrons do not directly interact with the zero point fluctuations, okay? And in, all right. So the model for our coupling is, looks like this. It's a model of coupling the local energy density, oh, sorry, the local energy density here, uh, the local electron density with the energy density of the polarization, okay? Again, the electrons don't couple directly to the zero point fluctuations. This is a little bit like baryons don't couple directly to dark matter, but they do know about dark matter through the stress energy tensor. And that's what we're arguing here, okay? And uh, what you can see is that the, this will suppress this, the, having the, uh, the electron density there will suppress the fluctuations of the critical phonons. And similarly, the critical phonons will suppress the nearby electrons. And so you can get a reduction of the chemical potential. And we see that fluctuations of the critical phonon energy density near the electrons will result in attractive potential. These are pictures. I'll give you a better sense of how this works in a minute. So what is the action? Well, we have to have an electronic part, okay? Here we have the electronic part. Then we have the energy fluctuation part, and we have the electrostatic interactions and the polar fluctuations. So let's start simply. Let's take G equals zero, no coupling. If we take zero, G equals zero, we integrate over the longitudinal modes. And what we have here is we have our dielectric constant, okay? And the dielectric constant uh, is, is the, that we're going to put in is going to be only ionic, okay? All right. And the, once again, we see that the quantum critical transverse modes are completely decoupled from the electronic degrees of freedom, 
Okay, and once again, this is why we invoke energy fluctuations. Now, to answer Collier's question, weak versus strong coupling. Normally, when we have a very dilute system, we have strong coupling. So when we look at weak versus strong coupling, we compare the Coulomb to the kinetic energy. Rs is then one over KFAB. And since KF goes as N to the one third, you might think that this might be very large. But as has been emphasized by Dmitry Maslov, here in dilute quantum critical metals, what's interesting about them is the fact that because of the Bohr radius, and the Bohr radius includes the dielectric constant, so it's quite large, RS is very, very small. And so RS is uh, much, much less than one, and so we're weakly interacting. And that's because we're close to the quantum critical point. Okay. So we can use weak coupling theory. Even though Sri likes to talk about as the tyranny of weak coupling theory, I like weak coupling theory because it's where I can do, I know how to calculate. But Sri knows about other things. Okay, so to lowest order, we're in 3D. Yes. This is that if you calculate any if you start with the diagram, if you okay. start with the component and then calculate any vertex correction just to check. Yes. Normally, the closer to the critical point will be used in the denominator of vertex that, correction. That's, that's, that's right. That's right. What happens here? Well, to be honest, we haven't done that. We've only done the weak coupling calculation. So it's weak coupling in the sense that overall factor is small, but you don't know whether it's still theory in which you're getting less perfect correction. I think that's probably the right. I would say that's probably a fair statement. We assume that because RS was so small, we just had to do the leading order. Okay, but we have not calculated the vertex corrections. What I can say is that, for example, I talk about this is clearly a two phonon interaction. And you might ask, why am I talking about also energy fluctuations? In 3D, the corrections to the two phonon interactions, which come from quartic terms, which is sort of related to your question, are logarithmic. So maybe that's sort of an answer. In two dimensions, which I will discuss, they're not logarithmic. But they can be what? Yes, yes. So I think that's sort of an answer to your question. Yeah. Uh, that's all I can say that it's sure. that that that's it. In two D, it's not. The energy fluctuations have an anomalous dimension, mm -hmm. and in fact, phonons are not well defined. But we can still talk about energy fluctuations, and as we'll see, they actually save us. We still have a Fermi loop. So that's the best I can answer. Since this is less relevant in the RG sense than the standard Yukawa coupling, you would expect the vertex. Yeah, that's what I. That's that was basically the argument. That uh, thank you, Sweet. When we in this interaction is is uh, is irrelevant in the scaling sense, and so we don't expect the higher order to be important, but we haven't actually calculated it. Okay, so link with prior work. Uh, this two phonon exchange. First of all, Abhishek and uh, Dimitri uh, were able to solve a rather uh, outstanding puzzle in strontium titanate using this two phonon exchange. Um, we have a row that goes like T squared. Recall that Malta mentioned a T squared yesterday. We have a row that goes as T squared. Now you might say, what's the big deal? The problem is the Fermi temperature is something like 10 degrees and T squared is going just all the way up. And so the, why is it still T squared even though it's in the classical regime? And so Abhishek and Dimitri and his collaborators, their collaborators actually showed that with this, uh, oh, I have to do it here, with this two phonon exchange, you can explain that. And that got us thinking about the superconductivity. We are not the first to suggest the superconductivity. It was proposed many years ago by Nagai, actually based on Raman data at Bell Labs by John Raman. Okay, two photon Dirk van der Merrill has also suggested it. So we're sort of fleshing out some of the arguments that they had. So the question is, what happens when we apply this to dilute quantum critical polar metals? So now let's talk about the coupling to the energy fluctuations when G is finite. The first thing we get when G is finite is we get a hardening of the polar mode. Okay, so what we get is that omega T 
as a function of n is the original transverse optical mode plus another term that's proportional to the density. So omega t is now proportional to n to the one half. Okay, so this suppresses the polar state, but that means we suppress the polar state by charge doping. This has been known for a long time. This is neutron data, omega versus q, you see. And note that g over a zero cubed is about 6.6, okay? That's the value of the electron phonon coupling, okay? And the reason we'll talk about that is because you'll see that there's going to be a unified picture. This is consistent with observation. And of course, we're taking G to be positive because of links with experiment. Okay, so the first thing we learn is that the applicate that doping shifts the quantum critical point. Okay, and if we want to look at density dependence, we have to take this into account. Now, energy fluctuation, the energy fluctuation coupling cannot be integrated exactly. However, we know from our past experience, and as Shreve just mentioned, that this interaction is irrelevant in the scaling sense. Our Fermi liquid is stable. And so we're going to fearlessly go ahead doing perturbative treatment. Okay. All right. So, What's our effective electron-electron interaction? Our effective electron-electron interaction at the quantum critical point goes as one over x to the fourth, okay? Here, omega goes like q. The phonon propagator goes as q one over q squared. So here it goes as one over x squared, one over x fourth, because we have two uh, phonon propagators. So at the quantum critical point, and here I'm taking x to be a uh, four vector, Okay, so I'm including space and time. At the quantum critical point, I have a one over x fourth behavior. All right. Well, we're gonna get, yes. Yeah, but I'm just being very heuristic at the moment. Okay, I'm just trying to give the lay of the land because I think it's too late in the week to be showing lots of calculation, but, you're, but it's one over x to the fourth, okay? There's a question from the chat, which is, is there a limit on the value G can, can attend? That was the, the uh, choice of word. Is there a limit? Well, we're going by experiment. So I obey nature's limits. So we're going by fitting to experiment. Okay. I mean, at some point, the, you know, that's all I can. So what happens away from the quantum critical point? Away from the quantum critical point, I have to think about length scales and energy scales. So suppose I have my quantum critical correlation volume, okay? In the volume, I have V as goes as one over X four to the fourth. And again, X, I'm being very heuristic here. X is as a four vector. Outside, I have some sort of exponential behavior, okay? Now, what are the scales in this problem? Well, in time, the correlation in time is defined by one over the omega t, okay? And that's, again, including the doping dependence. And in space will be the speed of sound over omega t. All right, so those are my scales, okay? And the next question is, what do the electrons sample? Well, the important scales for the electrons are one over Kf and one over Ef. And remember, both have density dependence. One has density dependence of n to the minus one third, and the other has density dependence of n to the minus two thirds. So in order to find out what the electrons sample, we have to compare these scales. So again, we're comparing the scales here with the scales here. So let's go ahead and just do that. All right, so let's take the first case. If one over Kf and one over Ef are very small compared to these correlation lengths, then we're quantum critical in space and time. The electrons don't know about the boundaries and we're just quantum critical, okay? But remember that Kf goes as n to the one third. So this is a very high density regime and we're not there. 
So let's think about the next possibility. Oh, here, if he goes as one over X to the fourth. The next possibility is what if one over KF is one over KF is less than the spatial correlation, but one over EF is larger than the temporal correlation. Well, then we have quantum critical in space because in space, the electrons think we're critical, but we are local in time. And this is low density. And this is sort of Newtonian. It's instantaneous in time, but it's power law in space. Finally, what happens if the correlation length is less than one over KF and one over EF? That means that our correlation volume is small compared to what the electrons see. So then we're local in space and time, okay? And that's what we have. So just in summary, what we have is first, we're quantum critical in space and time, but that's for high density. At low density, we're quantum critical in space, but not in time. And then at very low density, we're local in space and time, okay? So let's just summarize this in a different way. Let's think of the density dependence of the effective interaction. So we can look at log of E versus log of N. Now we have three important energy scales. We have omega T, which goes as N to the half, and is density, of course. We have CSKF, which goes as N to the one third. And we have EF that goes as N to the two thirds. And so we have the different regimes. Here we have completely local. Here we have local in time, but power law in space. And here we didn't discuss this case, but we would have uh, local in space and power law in time. So in the first regime here, there's no Q dependence, no omega dependence. Second regime, we have no omega dependence. And third regime, we have no Q dependence. So this first regime here, is one that Dmitry Kisilov and Misha Feigelman have worked on, and Dima will be talking about it uh, shortly, okay, within a very similar approach. What we are focusing on is this regime, okay? All right, and there's no Q dependence. And part of the reason we focused on this regime is in this regime, the superconductivity is definitely bulk. Okay, so. How do we do our calculations? Well, when we, we talked about in space, but of course we do our calculations in momentum. And when we integrate this, we're gonna get a log, okay? But now what happens when we are away from the quantum critical point? Well, just again, very heuristically, when we're away from the quantum critical point, we're going to have these cutoffs, okay? So if we integrate over the Fermi surface, then we actually have a complicated formula, but let's just, let's just look at the physical aspects of this. What we have is we have a log, omega t is the cutoff just for the transverse optical mode. So it's like a Debye frequency for the transverse optical mode. Okay, and then we have the max of omega t, CSKF and EF, just as we discussed before. Now, the crucial thing to realize here is that large momenta contribute. We have a log divergence, large momenta contribute. So we're going to be looking at momenta across the Boolean zone. Remember about what Marvin Cohen did with the intervalley scattering. Here, we're going to say that we can have the sum of momenta that is Q equals zero, but we can take momenta from across the Boolean zone. So now let's get, yes. Which one, so you take momenta when you go to the When you put the direction, we go back to this. Yeah, and I actually have the full formula if you want that. But you take T and T prime still form the term. Yes, yes. So this effect is good with the pairing T the term. Yes, yes. What is what the meaning of you take momentum? Because, well, I'm doing, okay, so what I'm saying is that large momenta are important. That will come. Yes. Compared to here. Yes. Yeah. No, 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 I meant large, no, no, I meant of order KF. Yeah, that's what I mean, that you can have, thank you, Nikolai. So I can have K 
K1 plus K2, but it but they have to add up to be small. So in that sense, it's very similar to what Marvin was talking about. Thank you. Okay. So superconductivity. So for low carrier density, the we want we'll see that the attractive interaction can overcome Coulomb repulsion, but let's just look at the attractive part of the effective coupling. So the attractive part of the effective coupling goes basically as KF log one over KF. Okay, that's a dome. Okay, that's very familiar for those of us who played with BCS equations. So it's KF one over KF, and we'll have a maximum when KF is of order the cutoff divided by two CS. Okay, so without just looking at this, and it's that log that's crucial. That's why I kept hammering about the log. Okay, the log is crucial, and the log has an argument that's density dependent. And KF goes as n to the one third. So, what do we get in terms of the maximum? Where is our maximum in terms of density? Well, here, and this is why it's important that we have uh, that we are looking at k vectors across the Brion zone, we can look at the dispersion. Of course, we just consider a very simple quadratic dispersion, but in strontium titanate, it's very steep and goes like this. So when we put in, when we calculate the cutoff to the optical phonon, we don't just take the speed of sound from here, we actually do a Debye average over the whole Brion zone. Okay, and you'll see why that's important because n max then is going to be CS average over CS. Okay, and so the maximum, because we have a phonon dispersion that flattens near the Brion edge, we have the average value of CS is much less than CS. And n max of A0 cubed is going to be much less than one. So we're well below half billing. Okay, and the other independent, the other point that I want to make is that the maximum density is independent of the coupling constant. Okay, thank you. All right. So now we can actually look at the superconducting coupling. And here in this region, the Coulomb repulsion is just uh, going to be a constant times the density of states. So it's just going to move things around. But as long, what we need for this theory is we need to be close to the quantum critical point for the dielectric constant to be large. And we have to be low density so that the log wins. Okay. And when we do that, we get TC of, uh, we can use the formula by Gorkov and Malik Barkhudarov. Is that right? Barkhudarov. Barkhudarov. Gorkov and Malik Barkhudarov. Okay, I'm still getting it. Barkudarov, which was summarized more recently by Gorkov. Okay, and so T TC has a dome behavior as a function of carrier density. So when we actually, yes. Do you want me to go back? No, that's okay. I, this is what happens when I can't say a Russian name. Okay. Yeah. That's what, that's what yeah. The, so the question is, is there G under the log? Uh, I have to, for that, I have to. The reason I'm asking is that if you go back to this kind of problem, that uh, quite nice because at some point you get TC goes at e to minus one of a square root of something if you put if you see g in the cup. Yeah, I think it does actually. I can go to the end. I have the full. Can we do it after? I have the full formula, uh -huh. which I can do, and the g is in the log. But then the TC goes in those e to minus one of a square root of g or something as the maximum. Uh, perhaps that's something to check. We haven't, the honest truth is we haven't done that. Okay. okay but G, I, I, I wanted to just get across, uh, the main aspect of this formula, but I can show you the thing. And I, I think it's, it's definitely there. We have very similar formulas, not surprising. Okay. So our maximum just to, uh, 
ju just to say, so what do we have here? Okay, we have strontium uh, ruthenate again, it's not strontium ruthenate, I was listening to your talk. Strontium titanate, uh, there's a strontium there and an oxygen. Strontium titanate, uh, what do we have here? Well, the red points are data, the black points are uh, what is our fit to that. We use G over A0 cubed to be 0.7. That's important because that coupling constant is very similar. That's why it has to be in the log. The coupling constant is, is very uh, similar to what was used by Dimitri and Abhishek and also by uh, in the other one. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, we can push this. I'm running out of time. So I'm just gonna say our calculations are only good until here. This is where the dynamical effects that Andre was talking about at the end of his talk on Monday have to be included. So EF is less than K CSKF below that line. Above, we have to include the electronic contributions to the dielectric constant and look at the frequency dependence. As we learned from Andre, the Coulomb repulsion will get stronger as we increase the frequency dependence. The attraction will go down and so you're going to have the interaction change as a function of frequency. And so you can play some games with retardation. Okay, we haven't done that yet. Okay, did I get that right, Andre? Good. See, I listened to you too. Okay, so a couple of things. Uh, Harold Huang mentioned uh, a measure that in STM measurements that we have a good BCS superconductor. It's not, I mean, it looks like BCS. We get that. Uh, we also are able to, putting in our numbers, get the kind of experimental values that the Cambridge group gets. Um, in terms of predictions, um, it's always very nice to postdict what's been seen, but what can we make a prediction? Well, one of the things we can do is say that in 2D, this should be more enhanced. And so we said, well, if you could make a, a, a 2D uh, doped strontium titanate film, this is what we would expect. So what are the distinguishing features? I want time for questions. What are the distinguishing features of the energy fluctuation me mechanism? And you're going to hear about more of it from Dima shortly. First is that it's a unified approach to a couple of different issues. One is that rho goes like T squared is the dominant coupling to the electron, to the energy fluctuations. I should say there's still some mystery at low temperatures, but for a very large temporary regime. The second is that we have suppression of the polar state with doping. And in all of these cases, we have a G over A0 cubed that goes from 0.5 to 0.7. And so it's a unified approach to very different properties of this material. Now we have a scaling of TC with the photon frequency and sensitivity to carrier density and low, uh, low doping concentrations. And remember that in this, our normal state is a Fermi liquid. There's nothing particularly fancy about the normal state. And so in summary, um, we have dilute quantum critical polar metals. Uh, we've, I've done my best to, uh, to um, tell you our story about two phonon coupling. It works for intermediate densities. Dima is gonna tell you about what happens at low densities. And we believe that there are plenty of polar metals that if we suppress TC, then perhaps we can get some new low density superconductors. So thank you very much. Thank you. Questions? Yes, do you want to see the full, this is, I think Dima will show it too, but this is what the full formula looks like. And you see that G is going to enter because G always enters in omega T. Yeah, very good. So yep. that's uh, that should have been my answer to you right away. That you see, we have this is a crossover function. This is what, remember what I did was this is the function that gives us all those maxes. One thing we learned from our dear friend Elihu is when you have a complicated function, always when you have crossover, present it as different maximum cutoffs. So this is what's giving us our cutoff, but you see right away that we have a G. Um, yeah. I was asking many questions, so I will try to be quick. Um, no, I, we, you've been asking sure. questions for years. Yeah, go. Well, we yeah. might as well continue. Uh, you mentioned that, uh, and you used, in fact, the square of many people who are a formula. Uh, question, yeah. yeah, question about um, 
this formula and whether you need to use it. And I'm, I'll try to ask the question. The story with Gorkov Melik Borhodarov is that uh, you have a prefactor of Fermi energy, and anything that goes at energy is larger than Fermi energy, in fact, can be incorporated in normalization of interaction to scattering amplitude. That's right. Which you don't do. You yes. deal with whatever interaction you have. Yeah, very simple. So then question is this, don't you restrict yourself to pairing very near the Fermi surface, putting EF as an upper cutoff in a situation when EF is small and you may have a pairing extending far away from the Fermi surface, which will give you larger TC because then you will involve fermions not necessarily on the Fermi surface. Uh, it's a question. Okay. Uh, I Well, I guess you also have the same question. I mean, um, okay. The, uh, the, the yes, I know. I under. I, and I'm wondering whether you will get higher because of this. Because again, the story with Gurkhov telling Prokhodara is that everything that comes from the energy is larger than here can be incorporated into the normalization. Okay, so, th so then you can view this as a minimum TC. You're viewing this as a minimum TC. I mean, okay, that's, that's actually an interesting point, particularly because one of the things we've been thinking about, which is related to Andy's talk, is everything here was in the nearly polar phase but you can also go into the polar phase and then instead of p instead of p you have p plus average p and when you have p plus average p that means your tc will be a function of strain okay and so what it means is you could really boost your tc in the system in your kind of in cliffs uh thing suzanne stemmer at santa barbara has some work on this which shows TC to be higher, but I actually think you could really bring it up. And that would might be a test for this kind of mechanism. But I should say that we were just happy to get a TC that seemed re, uh, reasonable, but I see what you're saying. Okay. Do you have an answer to that, Dima? Okay. Let, let me read some statements from the chat and then we should wrap up. The first Lara Berpato says the other scenario based on two phonon processes can also explain the same features resistivity, shift of omega, et cetera, uh, question mark. Uh, in other words, do we have a real way to decide which proposal works better? That's one. And then okay, Pierce has a, a bunch of comments, which I'll invite him to say. Yeah, well. just a moment. So Laura is, uh, what? what is, I didn't quite understand what Laura was saying. Laura, do you want to um, I, I mean, speak? Uh, all I'm saying is it's a unified approach uh, to- oh, Laura the, cannot. Okay, it's a, oh, she's giving an exam. It's a unified approach to these different uh, phenomena, but we're still working on, I don't, uh, uh, we, haven't, we haven't solved everything yet. There's still work to be done. Okay, uh, Marco has his hand up. Maybe, okay. maybe, I, maybe I can verbalize what I wrote in the chat. Um, how, about, how about after Marco and then I'll come well, back I think he, he but wants it is to a direct reply to what was okay. just, Discussed, and you didn't read right. it out either. So you are you are selectively taking one part of the story, which is, of course, what certain news channels do. But you don't do that. So let me say it, okay? Um, oh wow! Uh, so so the point is that, as uh, I think Premi said, is that is that uh, it's a little bit like in StatMec. Uh, in StatMec, when you're above the upper critical dimension, you can just do perturbation theory. Uh, but once you go below the upper critical dimensions, things start to normalize. And so it's correct that above two, above the critical dimension, which would be four here, two phonon processes uh, are just perturbative. But once you go at or below, they renormalize, and it's more correct to refer to them uh, as energy fluctuations, because the exponents that come in are the same as the energy fluctuation exponents. Pierce, but I believe that uh, Andre was asking why we uh, no, I was used- reply, I wasn't replying to Andre, I was replying to Lara. Oh, I see. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I didn't get a chance to reply to Lara, but that's okay. Okay. Yeah, Thank I actually you, have, uh, Lara, I have a, a slide exactly about that. So let me just show you. Uh, basically when Pavel did it in 2D, let me get to it. When Pavel did it in 2D, we had to, in fact, in 2D, the interaction, the Fermi liquid is marginal, which could be a problem. 
But thankfully, the quartic interactions uh, save us. And so the uh, energy fluctuations have an anomalous dimensionality. And what we've done is just the first step. So thank you. Let's ask uh, Marco to turn on his. Sure. Uh, hi, Premi. Nice to see you. Hi, and Marco. I'm sorry that I couldn't make to come to in person to Trieste. But nice. Yes, I'm sorry thank you too. for your nice talk. Um, so let me ask uh, this question. Uh, we are in a situation in which we have. Um, a rather weak and strongly suppressed Coulomb repulsion. We have a rather small kinetic energy, and still we have a rather effective attraction mechanism lurking around. So the um, instinctive uh, aptitude for me would be to worry about uh, phase separation or weakly frustrated phase separation. So of course, uh, superconductivity is a good alternative to that because uh, already 30 years ago, we studied a condolatis model, which was introduced by Pierce and Nathan Andre. And we found precisely that uh, usually the system likes to be superconducting, but if you kill by hand superconductivity, there is a large region in the phase diagram, which becomes phase separated. Now I was wondering what happens here. So you have again superconductivity, which protects the system against phase separation, or this is something we should still have and find somewhere? At, at low density, we probably have some phase separation. And in fact, that's one of the reasons that we only, let me go back to the original plots. Uh, at very low densities, it's believed that the super at very low densities here, it's believed that we have filamentary superconductivity. Okay? okay. There's no, as I understand it to date, there's no bulk evidence for superconductivity. The only evidence is transport. And so that would play into what you are saying. However, um, my experimental friends, particularly Gill and Cumran, suggest that above about here. 10 to the 18 or so, um, we have bulk superconductivity and they don't see any evidence for phase separation there. So that's one of the reasons that we focused on this region here and didn't play and didn't pay as much attention to the lower density state. Still, I should say that philosophically, it's very interesting to ask what happens at such low densities and Dima is going to talk about that shortly. So uh, let me ask then the question, if you suppose you kill by hand superconductivity, then yes. is the compressibility positive or negative in this case? Did you check that? Suppose in this I, region, in this um, in in this low region, low density. No, in the blue one. I mean the one. Oh, the blue one. I don't know if that experiment has been done. Mm -hmm. I understand what you're asking, but I don't believe that experiment has been done. I think the experimentalists are so thrilled to get to superconductivity that they don't want to kill it. But okay. I, I can ask. Okay. Thank you. Sorry have, that I can't answer. We have uh, 15 minutes for coffee, but before we go, let's thank Remy one more time. So just for the online audience and for everyone here, it's 11 o'clock. We'll meet back at 11.15 for the next talk, which is online. <laughs>